Hey, I'm Chris Epp from Make Everything. We're here at Jimmy Duresta's house for the weekend and I'm with my friend Paul Pinto. He's gonna show me how to make a hammer. I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing. So let's get right into it. Check it out. All right, so I basically have no idea what I'm doing throughout the process of this. Um, Paul walked me through it. And this video, I'm gonna sort of let it explain for itself as it goes and just kind of give a little bit of background as we get through it. We did it. This place is like movie trap. <laughs> it's Jimmy trap. So we cut off a piece of 1045 bar stock and then we're gonna be using the coal forge for this. Um, it's forced air forge and we're gonna be using the coal iron works 25 ton hydraulic press to just square up that round billet and uh, go from the two and a half inch round into about a two and a quarter by two and a quarter square and that'll just make the process of drifting it a little bit easier. We're now uh, pressing it from the other side which just sort of upsets it a little bit and makes it a little more symmetrical. So once we had gotten it nice and squared up and evened out, I used a pair of dividing calipers to just find the center of the billet on both sides so that I could center punch that and make sure that when we drift it, it's in the right spot. Sorry, I'm denting, this, I'm, I'm denting this junky hammer, so... That looks good to me. Yeah, you're good. All right, cool. We're done. But, but, you know, you got to do the other side. All right, now I go to the drill press, right? Yeah, do the other side. <laughs> <laughs> joke, but uh, I know a lot of guys that do that. No, well, now I got to mark the other side. Really yeah, I see it. I see it. Yeah, yeah, they do I'll two, two uh, quarter-inch holes right next to each other. Again, just using those dividing calipers to find the center of the billet. So, I'm just holding that punch, yeah? Yeah. Like you, Which center? Where am I going? Brush. There's no steel in here. Go over, yeah. the, not over the hole, right there. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's better than something. Better than something. Hold it straight, Chris. Now, and now, it out now and spin it. Oh, see that seems. No, like, but you could keep it and, and. That's like this is a difficult thing to do quickly. Because this <laughs> thing. <laughs> we gotta see. So slow. <laughs> so slow. So yeah. slow. I feel like it's just gonna fall on that hole. No, no, no. Watch this though. Can't you just turn the hammer? Just go like that. Ah, okay. Yeah. That's the whole point of those tongs. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So like that. There you ah. go. There you go. Ah. Cook a little peanut oil now. There you go. This is gonna take a day and a half. Oh man, this is gonna be a while. Oh. Holy West shit, you did that for Midwest, two days. Midwest. Oh. Midwest. He did it alone for two days. Holy hell. Yeah, drifting by yourself is a brutal process. I'll show you the drift. I mean, at what point do we hit it? It's not a drift. That's kind of a cool resonating. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, you're getting it now, man. I take it. Yeah. 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 You get close. Throw it back in. Next one. You get that thing yellow. So basically what we're doing is we're using a punch with a handle on it to drive that first hole through the billet. Once we get this hole in, we can then make it wider with a longer drift. Oh, it's a crisp for $1,200. Oh, I need it. Did that really just 
just happened? <laughs> <laughs> what? 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 Is it almost out? Almost. Yeah. Got enough heat in it to do it? Yeah. It's almost sometimes when it gets a little colder, it makes it brittle. It almost shears more yeah. instead of just bending. We'll see, maybe we'll have to. Oh, there it is. You gotta there keep that plug. That's your first. It's my first plug. All right. All right. There we go. That's a nice hole. That's a nice hole. What am I doing? I'm just hitting. You don't need these tools. Don't need them. So I'm just hitting. Just keep hitting it. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. You good? The key here is to get this thing super hot to drive that drift. This process went on for a while, basically just trying to lodge that long tapered drift through the billet in order to make the hammer eye hole a good enough size that my handle wouldn't be tiny. Um, we really didn't drift it enough, but we did as much as we could by hand. And I'm hitting here or here? Over, over a hole, do it on the flat spot. But I'm hitting here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't do it over a hole. Yeah, and do it on this right here, because you don't want to hit down there because it's close up. Yeah. Something to note, we didn't have a hammer eye drift at Jimmy's when we got there for the weekend. Paul whipped out this hammer eye drift. He made it out of a piece of 1045 uh, carbon steel that we had laying around, and he heat treated it and, and made it literally on the spot. So thanks to Paul for doing that, because without that, we wouldn't have been able to do anything. But it really didn't have the proper geometry in order to do this optimally, which is partially why it took so long just to drift this one hammer hole. So once I'd established that shape, we wanted to make a Swedish cross peen. And even though we didn't have the right dies on the forging press, we decided to try it anyway. That might have been a mistake, but we recovered from it eventually. So like I should start like here? Yeah, yeah. Just, just push down, yeah, yeah. Am I going? Yeah, 
So really we should have had rounded dies on the press in order to draw out the backside of that billet. We only had these very sharp square dies. So we were able to get the shape, but we put a lot of really bad facets in it and basically spent the next couple of hours just trying to get those out using the horn of the anvil and a rounding hammer. This wound up being super labor intensive and didn't really come out exactly like I wanted, but for my first try, I wasn't too upset about it. I hear it echoing <laughs> off the barn. That's not bad. I was trying not to laugh. Oh my god. Maybe I could heat it up, get it in the vise, and just knock it over, no? Like, hey, oh, you know what? Like, no, clamp this in the vise. Yeah, and, and then, then knock that. that yeah, side. yeah. Except Let's... that vise is not really, like, installed properly. It's <laughs> hanging from the bottom. Oh, we'll do this one, mate. Oh, that's kind of small. Yeah, that's fine. We'll try that one, yeah. Feel like I can just planish out the sides, yeah, and like be done with it. I got it. I got it. Okay. All right, a little one more heat, straighten that out, and I yeah. think I'm good. Yeah. Man, you came a long way. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I wasn't taking it out. I was just getting the cheeks. Can you tighten that up for me? Yeah. I thought you were going to take it out. I'm like, what? I forget which way I'm going now. I'm going this way. On your way. left. Yeah. Going this way. Yeah, there you go. So the next day, I clamped the hammerhead in the vise and used the grinder to cut off the end of that peen, which had gotten out too long. I had drawn it out too far. And then basically just using a flap wheel and the corded grinder, I started in to clean up the peen and get rid of some of those really hard facets that I left in with that sharp edge of the forging press. Now, as you're going to see, I'm a far better grinder than I am a blacksmith. Um, and I'm a little ashamed that I had to cover up all these errors, but in the end, I did want the hammer to look better than it did with all those facets in it. So using a 40 grit flap disc, I just basically used the tip of it to round in those contours and make the whole thing look really nice and smooth. I also used it to sort of chamfer the edges, and then I go and address the face of the hammer as well. Now normally I would have used a belt grinder for this, but I didn't really want to use up Jimmy's belts, so I decided to just use the flap disc that I brought with me and just blaze through the material nice and fast. Oh, I like 
get there. We're getting there. Once I had addressed the backside of the peen, I just addressed the front right behind the face and just sort of rounded that stuff out too. Again, getting rid of some of those facets that were left from the forging press and those sharp dies. Now the press worked really, really well. And like I said, I just want to repeat, it was the dies, not the press that made me this hard time. But after I was done grinding it, I put it back in the fire, let it get red hot and then let it cool down slowly to anneal it and get it soft and sort of settle those molecules inside the steel. Now, back at my shop, I used my small press to get the hammerhead hot enough that I could stamp a maker's mark into it. And now on my knives, I just use a simple Z uh, for my last name, Zeppieri. And I figured on this one, I would kind of carry that theme forward. I let the hammer get red hot, and I'm gonna go ahead and put that hammer eye drift that Paul gave me into it and then use one of the letter punches to stamp my initial in that top side of the hammer. Once that was done, it went back in the forge and I heated it up to a critical temperature, um, non-magnetic, and then quench it in water in order to get it really, really hard. Now the heat treating of a hammer is similar to the heat treating of a knife. You get it up to a critical temperature and you quench it and then the object becomes extremely hard but also brittle and it needs to be tempered back. So in this case, uh, Zach from ZHFab gave me the temperature in order to temper it back with. As you see, when it comes out of the water, it's so hard, the file skates right across it. Then it's gonna go in my oven at 425 degrees for two hours, two times, and that'll temper it back to make it soft enough that it won't break, but hard enough that it'll strike metal really well. Once it's out of the oven, I take it over to the wire wheel, and I just wire wheel off some of the scale that came from that heat treating process, um, a little bit of scale builds up from that intense heat, and it just sort of polishes it, makes it a little bit shiny. And um, I'm gonna be using ash for the handle. I have some straight grain ash that I really like to use for ax handles. It's incredibly strong. Ash makes a really good tool handle if you're ever handling an ax or a hammer and you can get your hands on some ash. It's kind of a pain to work with because it is so hard, but it's gonna last a really, really long time. So I basically just rip it down, uh, in two directions and get myself a nice little hammer blank and then I'm going to go ahead and put a 45 degree bevel on all four of the sides. Um, I prefer a pretty geometric handle. I know it's probably going to look like I'm just being lazy but I actually do really like a geometric handle versus an oval handle when I'm uh, using any sort of hammer for blacksmithing mainly because I like to choke up on the hammer and I don't like the the diameter of the handle to change depending on where my hand is on the handle. So once I have that 45, I do round the edges just a little bit on the sander, and then I can take it over to the vise, and I can start using the draw knife to get that hammer eye uh, cut down so that it'll fit inside the actual hammer head itself. I just make sure to mark a center line whenever I'm going to use a draw knife to make a hammer handle or an axe handle like this. Now when we drifted out that hammer head, we unfortunately didn't really drift it far enough. The hole in the, in the hammer head itself, the eye, it's really not big enough for the size hammer head. I'm not sure how this is going to hold up, but you'll see I really have to taper down that material in order to get the hammer head on it. Um, I think it'll be alright, but might fail, who knows. So now I'm just cutting the relief cut and getting that hammerhead really nice and set onto the handle. What I forgot to film was putting in the wedge. I used a solid mahogany wedge and some glue to really make sure that that handle split, spread apart inside the hammer eye and made a really, really great seal. It's not loose at all. It has absolutely no wobble. And once that was done, I took it back over to the sander with a slack belt and just sort of continued to round over the profile. And then I decided to use this 80 grit belt and tune up the faces. There was a pretty bad divot in the center of the face that I left with the grinder when I was up at Jimmy's. So using this slack belt gave me a nice sort of rounded face that's also pretty much flat. Um, and then once that was done, I went over to the other 2x72 grinder and used the scotch Bright to sort of polish up the peen and polish up that flat face. 
I also thought the handle was a little bit too long, so I cut that down and just gave it some final sanding to get it to the length and the feel that I was looking for. Now I'm going to be using a boiled linseed oil, which was something that Paul recommended just to seal up that wood and also put some on the hammerhead itself and it'll act as a sealer and keep it from corroding and oxidizing. Overall, I'm really, really happy with how this thing came out. We're done. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. I had so much fun making this hammer. I learned a tremendous amount. Thank you again to Paul Pinto um, for helping me through this and basically holding my hand for the 10 or so hours that we stood out in the cold and made this thing. Check out his YouTube and his Instagram. He's an incredible 18 year old blacksmith, a great teacher, super talented guy. Thanks so much to Jimmy, Taylor, and Brett for accommodating me and the rest of the guys over the weekend. We had an amazing time blacksmithing. And thanks to all the guys that helped out during this. Um, Rory, Kevin, Chris, Cliff, Zach, Mike. Um, it was really just an amazing experience altogether. I can't wait to do more blacksmithing. If you enjoyed this video, let me know down below. Ask questions, follow me on Instagram, and don't forget to follow all my friends' Instagrams and YouTubes. All those links will be down below. Subscribe for more. I hope to see you on the next video.